All right, welcome to Revelation, and we're going to um, do your final review for this class, so feel free to have it out, print it, fast forward and rewind as necessary, and just kind of follow along and fill in as we go. All right, number one, discuss in your own words why it is probable that the reference to Babylon in the book of Revelation is actually a reference to Jerusalem, right? So I want, I'm going to give you that one to do on your own, right? So we talked about several reasons why um, to give you a hint you know you're going to want to look at the great prostitute is connected with Babylon the great city is connected with the great prostitute and Jerusalem is identified as the great city so something along those lines if you've got some other things that you want to contribute to that um, that's fine alright number two explain the similarity between how an angel communicates and how an Old Testament prophet communicated. So the basic idea is that their communication seems very similar, that they would enact something that carried a principle, that taught a lesson through a visual representation, right? So the prophets would often enact and, and portray, you know, visually something that confirmed what they were saying with their message, right? You know, so Ezekiel would lay on his side, right? And, and so he, he did the act, and he spoke the words. So we see this quite a bit with the angels. When we see them, they are enacting something so that we can see it and understand it. All right. Number three, what number seems to be the dominant theme throughout this book? Seven. Right? The seven trumpets, seven seals, seven bowls of wrath, seven spirits, seven churches. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff. Seven plagues, seven thunders. You know, there's there's a lot of of that, right? Okay. Explain how the meaning of the word translated as either earth or land is influential on how we understand the meaning of the text. So if remember we talked about the fact that, that this word, um, G A S in Greek, can you know, can refer to land, it can refer to the earth, um, that it was a, a fairly broad word, um, and so many of the passages that get translated as earth make it seem like it's got to be a worldwide phenomenon. But if you translate that same word, which is just as valid as land instead of earth, then all of a sudden it opens up the possibility of a much more localized thing dealing just with the nation of Israel. Alright. Um, number five, explain the concept of angel as understood in antiquity. The basic idea here is that it's something broader than just an angelic being, uh, that they often understood the word angel to be, you know, a supernatural medium between God and man, you know, so, um, so it wasn't just what we think of as someone flying around with angels, it was often some kind of supernatural representation, it could be, you know, a vision kind of thing, you know, so it was, it was a little broader in concept, right, that's why, you know, you could see the angel of the Lord, Christ is described as an angel in one spot, um, and so it's it's a more broad kind of description, right? All right. Number six, burnished bronze was a mix of what two elements? That was uh, gold and copper. Right? Gold and copper. Go on to the next one. Um, so six, gold and copper. Seven. Why is it interesting that John sees Jesus' face shining like the sun? I think this is interesting because John was one of the disciples who was with Jesus at the Transfiguration, right? And so at the Transfiguration, this same phrase is used, seeing him shining like the sun. So I think it's kind of an interesting uh, overlap there between those two. Number eight, beyond their immediate historical interpretation, what other possible meaning can be taken from this section of the letters to the seven churches? So this is about the seven churches and that whole section. And so the idea is that you can either take them as all occurring right then, and it's just seven churches chosen geographically, or it is symbolic, 
to describe seven ages of the church that is to come, right? With each age being a different kind of unfolding of the future church that is going to be revealed. Right? And it shows the challenge in there. And the challenge and the blessing for each generation is kind of described uh, if you take that that theory there. Okay. Number nine, explain why the Ten Commandments might have originally been written on a blue sapphire stone. So you can go back in and look at this. It was the basic idea is that um, that the only stone being described there in that section is the blue sapphire stone that he sees when he's looking at God's throne, and it says that God was the one that wrote this first one and gave it to Moses, but then he broke it. Um, and then we know uh, that uh, when they had their garments, that God told them to put a blue cord on there to represent the commandments. Okay. Okay. Number 10, explain the significance of the number 144,000. So on this one, what I'm wanting is the reference to David's army, this being half of David's army, that there was half before, half after. Uh, the birth of Christ, and so it's a symbolic of this is half of the people of God, and then the other half uh, come after the birth of Christ. All right, number eleven. What is the main difference between the first group of 144,000 and the second? The first group of 144,000 are described as having the mark of God on their forehead. It's the same phrase from Ezekiel, when the glory leaves and God saves some who did not. Uh, fall away, right? And then the 144,000 in the second, the reference there that says they have the name of God and the name of the Lamb on their forehead, and so they are marked not just with the mark of God, but it's it's specifically the mark of God and the mark of the Lamb, the name of God and the name of the Lamb. So the addition of the reference to Jesus in this second group is significant. Number 12, explain in your own words why it is vital to be familiar with Old Testament prophecy before you begin trying to interpret the book of Revelation. All right? So I'll let you answer this one in your own way, but the basic idea is that there was so much in the book of Revelation that is built on Old Testament prophecy that if you don't understand how the phrase was used originally, you will take it to literally if you're not careful. I think this is the mistake that most people make when they're trying to give an interpretation of the book of Revelation, is they're just not familiar with these phrases from the Old Testament. So when they hear them for the first time, their mind begins to wander. But if you read them in context the first time of the Old Testament, it's pretty clear what they're referencing. So when somebody in the New Testament uses that same metaphor that they would have grown up with in their Jewish schools and their training in, 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 in Israel, they would have known the Old Testament well. So when they're drawing that metaphor out of the Old Testament, they're doing it because they knew what it meant originally, and they're trying to use that to help you understand this. So if you don't understand what it meant originally, you get all kinds of wild interpretations, and it seems a very, um, a very difficult book to grasp without understanding the Old Testament implications. Number 13, explain the symbolism of the enemy crossing the Euphrates River in, in chapter 16. The basic idea is that there's a parallel here between Israel crossing the Jordan or crossing the Red Sea, um, that here now the enemy is crossing over on dry land. And it's the Euphrates because that was the, the ideal border of Israel um, as given to Joshua, you know, because they had people on the east side of the Jordan. So the original... Um, ideal size of Israel went all the way to the Euphrates. So an enemy crossing the Euphrates over on dry land is almost metaphorical that now the enemy is crossing over into the promised land, right? Doing God's will, right? That they're going to execute judgment. That God is helping them do this, right? Number 14, measure the temple, measuring the temple rather, was often thought to be an expression of what? It's often thought to, you know, kind of reference the uh, the number of people that are going to come in. So not necessarily trying to give an exact count of the number of people, but it was a way of saying 
that there's going to be a lot of people included in this. That they weren't necessarily trying to give geographic dimensions as much as they were trying to say, at least this is how many of the older rabbis took it, that it was a reference to, um, it's a way of saying there's going to be a lot of people coming in to the kingdom. Right? It's more measuring the people in the kingdom than an actual wall. Um, okay. Number 15. What do we believe the woman giving birth in Revelation 12 is referenced to? So that's the birth of Christ. Right? The birth of Christ. 16. Explain in your own words the reasoning behind the identity given in class to the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. So I'm going to leave this one for you to do. Right? So the basic idea was the first beast parallels the beast from Daniel. The second beast parallels uh, the political climate there in uh, Israel. So that's all I'll give you, but go back in and watch that if you don't remember. Number 17, what is the significance of the Lamb being in Zion in Revelation chapter 14? So prior to this, you see the Lamb opening the seven seals, but that's done in heaven. Then after the birth of the Messiah in chapters 12 and 13, now here in chapter 14, we see the Lamb is in Zion on earth and not uh, in heaven. So it's a picture of Christ's ministry here on the earth. Number 18, what two events are proclaimed by angels and occur directly after the Lamb is seen in Zion? Um, so right after the Lamb is seen in Zion, the angels go forth, and the two main things that they're focusing on is the, the, uh, the spread of the gospel, it says, and then the other one is the destruction of the temple. Right? Fallen is Babylon the Great. Okay. Um, number 19. Explain in your own words the significance of the last seven bowls being described as plagues. So I want something to the effect that in Deuteronomy, God said, When you finally fall away from me completely, I will bring on you the plagues that I brought on Egypt. And so we have here... There's seven of them and not ten, but it's it's the same concept that God is showing them. And he even calls them Egypt earlier in the in the book of Revelation. The basic idea is they have fallen away, and just like Moses said, if they fall away completely, that God will bring on them at the end the sev the plagues of Egypt, right? And so I think it's interesting that these seven bowls of wrath are described as the plagues, right? Number 20. Explain the connection between the concept of the flood in Noah's day and the fire that we see at the end of the book of Revelation. So this is that last class that we did. And the basic idea is that when the flood came, it was water from the earth and water from heaven combined to make the flood. And God said he'd never judge the earth again with water. Right? Uh, Peter says that God is going to judge the earth. It's going to be with fire this time. And so it's almost like you could expect to see a flood-like thing except with fire. And so in Revelations, before the thousand years of peace, we see the fire on the land, the lake of fire. And then at the end of the thousand years of peace, we see then the fire from heaven. And so it's almost like a picture of the judgment there uh, that we saw in Noah's day of water on the land and water from heaven. We see it now with fire in the end. All right, number 21, why is it important that the concept of the four horsemen is alluded to in the book of Ezekiel? Well, it helps us to have confidence then that these things that took place uh, you know uh, in uh, before chapters 12 and 13 right the seven seals and the seven trumpets it helps us to more accurately and more confidently assert that those were things that had taken place before Christ the destruction of the first temple because Solomon uh, not Solomon but Ezekiel rather sees God give him a description essentially of these four horsemen. He doesn't call them horsemen. But the the four things that the horseman does, he recounts almost word for word. And God says that that is going to be the beginning of his judgment on Solomon's temple. And so then we see here the seven seals, the very beginning of this story, um, is these four horsemen, which gives us confidence to assert that this is uh, initially here in Revelation, a description of the destruction of the first temple. Uh, which is also backed up by the fact that, you know, in the book he starts off by saying, I'm going to show you the things that are and the things that are to come. So some of this is stuff that's already happened and some of it is things to come. All right, list the five negative ways that Jerusalem is referenced in the book of Revelation. 
So there might be others, but there's five that stand out to me. He calls them Egypt, and I don't really need a description, just the list. Egypt, Sodom, Babylon, the great prostitute, and the fifth one. Sodom, Egypt, the great prostitute, the Babylon. I feel like there's one, an obvious one, that I'm missing here. Um, I may have to have you just give four if I can't think of what were the other ones. Sodom and Egypt, Babylon, the great prostitute. Yeah, let's just let's go with four on that one, um, and then I I wrote it at five, so I must have had a fifth one uh, in my mind at some point. Um, I think what I did is when I was counting them. Anytime you say Sodom, you're so used to saying Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so I think I probably said Sodom and Gomorrah as two, and then. And then went right into uh, Egypt and Babylon, and then the great prostitute. So let's do four on that one. So just give me the four, um, and I think that'll be good enough. Okay. Twenty-three. What two events must still pl take place for the nation of Israel? Okay. Um, so we talked about this. One of them is that the uh, surrounding area must be at peace. Because God says that when he calls them back, then there's going to be a time of peace where they're not worried about the surrounding nations. So they're definitely not there yet. And then the other one um, is that they are converted. Paul says that the Gentile church will be blessed so much that, that it draws the nation of Israel into jealousy, and then they are converted because they see God's hand on the Gentile nation. Right? And so that hasn't happened yet either. So the the peace around Israel and the conversion of Israel are still to come. Number 24. What enemy has apparently fought before and after the thousand years of peace? That's Gog and Magog. Right? 25. Who is the king of kings and lord of lords a reference to in the book of Ezekiel? That's Nebuchadnezzar. Right? And I put that in this final because it's a reference to Christ in this book, in the book of Revelation. Right? And so it's almost a picture of saying that in the same way that Nebuchadnezzar brought judgment on Israel, now the real king of kings and lord of lords is going to bring judgment on the surrounding nations. This is right before the battle with Gog and Magog. Right? Okay, uh, 26. What is Jerusalem called during the thousand years of peace? Right? So this is the beloved city. Number 27. What significance does the story of the woman at the well have for understanding of the new Jerusalem? So this is what I, I want you to focus on, is the water part, right? Jesus says that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit. And so Jesus gives this example of rivers of living water, but it was never about actual water, it was about the Spirit. So then we see the river of life in the New Jerusalem, and it's possible this is not an actual river, it's a reference to the abundance of God's presence, the abundance of his Holy Spirit that will cause us to be able to walk in life. All right, number 28, what is the possible significance that, Jeru that the New Jerusalem is described as being square? That the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, right, um, where the Ark of the Covenant was, was square. And so it's possible that this is a reference to saying that, oh, symbolism to say that this New Jerusalem, this new heaven, is perfect. It's the, the, the most holy place was the place where God dwelt. And so to say that this new Jerusalem, this uh, new temple is perfectly square might be a way of just saying, just like the most holy place, God is there. It's a place where God's presence dwells. Right? Okay, what is uh, the equivalent in the book of Ezekiel to the new Jerusalem in Revelation? So that's the new temple. Right? So the, in the book of Ezekiel, the description of the new temple is the corresponding thing that we see in Revelation to the New Jerusalem, right? 
All right, and then number 30, explain in your own words the basic overall flow of ideas that is taking place in the book of Revelation. All right, so to me, this is a really important one, uh, and it's, it's going to be on your own, right? But what I'm wanting you to do is, is in you know, a paragraph or two, give me your synopsis of how the flow of the book of Revelation goes. Give me the major points. What is the major flow uh, that we're looking at here? Okay. Um, so I've given you a few extra minutes on this final. You have an hour and 15 minutes because there's, there's a decent amount of typing. All right, so if you have any um, questions over this one, feel free to let me know. And um, you should have no problem uh, if you go back in and watch your videos.